Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross. It just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It's pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun. A closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet. A home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing. And of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This thing's gonna be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good, I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible, just right there, like the big moon, just it was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course, number seven, blowing cloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, ah, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. Up here, at least. But in 2008, at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, 
this eye patch that they called support. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. And I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really, great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches, the early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't wanna be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also, because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. 
Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's, that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health. And so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well-known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth and yes, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry. Hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. 
and yeah. Number five, Crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for? Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk. <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault 
a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10, pea toothpaste. We're starting off strong. <laughs> the Romans were an impressive people. They built the aqueducts, the Colosseum, the Senate, and I heard they didn't even build that in a day. Their society had a lot going on. Romans cared very deeply about their appearance and put a lot of effort into looking as nice as possible. And what better place to start than with a winning smile? Romans might not have had any toothpaste that dentists recommend, but they had something far more natural. Romans used liquid gold to whiten their smiles. There's a, there's a lot of ammonia in pee. It's an all natural teeth whitening tool. You gagging yet? Thinking about that, I'm not gonna be able to make it through this video. It wasn't just used for dental hygiene either. The Romans had a lot of fun, creative uses for their pee. They would buy bottles of Portuguese urine and use that as like a little rinse, a little mouse wash. I'm actually gagging talking about this. Importing bottled urine became so popular that the Emperor Nero taxed the trade. The ammonia in urine was thought to disinfect mouths and clean up your teeth and remained a popular mouthwash until the 18th century. They also thought that it helped with hair loss or skin care and was used for staining and softening leather. From just tip to toe, you could find yourself covered in pee. It was a convenient catch-all for all of life's problems. Toothache? Pee. Open wound? Pee. Hairs dry? Pee. Thirsty? Let's move on to the next point, okay? And if you're looking for way more disgusting things throughout history, you already know Bumblebee has all of that and then some. We've got lists on just about every gross and wild thing you can think of from all these different periods of time. So hit subscribe, please make sure you ring that little bell as well so you get all the up to date buzzes, but do that at the end of this video because I got nine more crazy hygiene practices coming for you right now. Number nine, fleas in your wig. During the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, there was very definitely one hair style that was significantly more popular than others. You already know the one I'm talking about, talking about the classic, that Washington look. A powdered wig really was the finest thing you can put on your head. It's a bit bizarre looking back on it, imagining that everyone was looking like Mozart all the time and that was the coolest thing you could look like apparently. Well, these things got pretty dirty, right? And you weren't gonna wash them the same way that you wash your hair. And you don't wanna be the only guy at the symphony with a stinky head. So to combat lice and other horrific pests that would be hiding in your wig, you'd have to get flea combs to get them all out. Or the alternative was that you send your wig off to a wig maker who would then boil the wig to remove the nits. Imagine having to boil your hair to make sure that there weren't any critters living inside your wig. Man, looking back on it, why did we ever get rid of powdered wigs? It seems like it was great. Number eight, arsenic wafers. For a long time, women of all creeds have sought to have the fairest skin possible. Pale, fair skin has traditionally been seen as a beauty standard, and women in the Victorian era would do just anything to get that freshly dead corpse white look. Not quite sure why looking like a recent victim was uh, ideal, but Victorian women loved it. And to get this near death look, they would put a few drops of citrus into their eyes to 
perk them up. They would wear veils and gloves and parasols to keep their skin pale, but their favorite trick was a little something from the Sears and Roebuck catalog, Dr. Rose's arsenic complexion wafers. This sounds like a joke, it was completely real. These little white wafers were advertised as perfectly harmless and were supposed to keep you pale. Well, in actuality, arsenic will cause kidney damage, hair loss, and well, yeah, it does cause vitiligo, which does cause a pigment loss in the skin. So you know what? Yeah, it does kind of give you that deathly pale look, but mostly it's because you are actually dying. So it's a very natural deathly look. Number seven, mummy powder. There is a lot of strange things we put in and on our body for the pursuit of beauty. We've already talked about using pee for toothpaste. That was the number 10 point in this video. So how much weirder can we truly get with this? Well, how about dried up, crushed up human remains as a beauty product? Well, in the Middle Ages, it was a practice to grind up mummies into a crunchy powder and used as a catch-all wonder cure. It was believed that consuming it had healing properties and you could use ground up mummy for just just about anything that was bothering you. It was supposed to thin out coagulations, you know, help with clots. It was effectual in purging of like a headache or, you know, it would be good against a cough, against inflammation. It was even said to be useful as a medicine for menstrual cramps. You know, it's that time of the month, just grind up a dead body and huff the fumes. That's part of the beauty of being a woman, huffing dead body fumes. Number six, leeching. Now, this one is probably a little more well known as far as absolutely disgusting historical practices go, but that doesn't make it any less disgusting. Leeching has been used for thousands of years, dating all the way back to ancient Greece and Egypt when bloodletting was a much more common practice. Uh, obviously, we kind of moved on from bloodletting, but back in the day, if you had something wrong with you, well, the most obvious solution would be to drill a little hole in your head and let everything sort of leak out, and that might make you Feel better. It might kill you, but it might make you feel better. Now, practitioners of the time would usually use some sort of little instrument or a little tool, a little goober to dig in there, get all that good fluid out. But more often than not, they would use nature's most effective little sucker, the leech. Once attached to the patient's skin, the leeches would do exactly what you'd expect them to do. They'd, they'd feed on a little meal. Now, here's one of the worst things I'm going to tell you in this entire video. This practice is not wholly extinct. Obviously, hospitals don't have fish tanks full of leeches swimming around, and modern clinicians don't particularly support the practice, but there are still some who believe in very specific applications to save limbs. They are sometimes used in certain microsurgeries and plastic surgeries still. So, <laughs> if you want to relive your history a bit. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un, just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Tan line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. 
America 1864 There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins, and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church, and they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg, a little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now, I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with it, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory. I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Number 10, spitting. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like browny green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ah, ha, ha. 
though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses in your body were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number five is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's ear. Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and back aches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number four in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was 
pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville. He created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wombs and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bressoyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection. Let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank god. Number 2 doesn't allow you to touch where number 1 usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously it's natural, normal and well fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a mans energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual disorder function as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise, surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston, said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once suck the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died 
did after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clamshells were used later in the 19th century, and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually, they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still, it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay! In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. 
It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. Back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna to stick to the spearmint. S spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack? Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood. Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood. The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know, like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself, do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then, one mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and move more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number two, the Egyptian Brazilian. The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless everywhere. Even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger, Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. Cut my hair, shaved shape my head, lots of baths. It's just, it's, it's no fun, man. Too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one, Wario breath. Wow, okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints in mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks. And when the recipe asks for one onion, eh, maybe I put in two. When it asks for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease and they were kind of right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. 
Thank God. What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. Not just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visee, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Evers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that shit, put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mixed in its gall and curd and apply to its eyes. I don't even know what the fuck that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription, you're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the great stink. 
Yeah, the great stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up in your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with St. Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number three, belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, and whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? 
got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Starting with trick number 10, Queen Caroline, the clothed bather. So I'm not gonna lie, like 80% of this list is gonna be bath specific because for some reason, royals got really weird with that. When Caroline arrived in England as Princess of Wales in 1714, she amazed the court with her regular bathing habits. She liked her skin and gowns to be clean and her servants well manicured, a completely unheard of requirement in the time. What can I say, in the 17th century, bathing was controversial. There was two sides to the debate. One that said that bathing was healthy, and the other that argued it could damage your health, except in the most carefully prescribed circumstances. Now, her frequent bathing isn't subject of this section, per se, because we don't perceive that as uncommon today. The commentary is actually going to be how on Caroline would bathe with clothing on. Not like those big old elaborate ball gowns, but in like a boxy slip, yeah. Wet but fully clothed, she would have been dunked with warm water, rubbed with flannel cloths, and treated with soap solutions and cosmetic preparations like may do, or the milk of asses and mares, which is a lovely little segue into milk baths, number nine. You may think I'm about to spew off some Cleopatra facts and stories, which is fair. She and the Empress Papapea did make this treatment famous, but I'm talking about a different monarch and one funky decision she'd make it after the bath. So milk baths use lactic acid, a alpha hydroxy acid, to dissolve the proteins which hold together dead skin cells. Whether or not the ancients knew all that, they could tell it had a rejuvenating effect on their skin. Whenever she was suffering from a distressing malady, which is olden terms for a woman being upset, Countess Platten Hanover bathed in milk and then generously donated the contaminated milk to the poor. Lives of Queen of England, The House of Hanover, Volume 1 by Dr. John Dunn documented one such occasion, writing, Whenever Countess von Platten designed to appear with more ordinary brilliance than her own person, she was accustomed to indulge in an extravagant luxury of a milk bath. And it was added by the satirical or the scandalous that the milk which had just lent softness to her skin was charitably distributed amongst the poor of the district wherein she occasionally affected to play the character of Dorcas from the Bible. Now to answer the age-old question, why toilets are called thrones is number eight. So French King Louis was downright gnarly. If he was alive now, the dude would probably be one of those people that's part of like that no shoes movement and refuses to wear deodorant and just terrorizes Walmart with how they smell. He famously made Versailles so bad, it smells to this day. And apparently he only bathed three times in his entire life, which should probably be punishable by death, because I can't imagine someone who has literally never bathed not smelling offensive. Apparently he changed his clothes three times a day and had a new perfume made every week to help, but this gross little weasel really went the full mile. He had a toilet seat under his throne and he would use it while addressing the court. Imagine dying of boredom during the king's mandate and all of a sudden he starts making faces and pausing in sentences and clinging to the throne arms trying to force out that day's dinner. Imagine accidentally making eye contact. I think I'm done with this segment now. And talking of unpleasant sights, Isabelline Brown is number seven on the list. Victorian orthonologists, that's a fancy name for bird science people, are some of the only fun sciencey folks out there. They like to use obscure adjectives when naming newfound species, especially those that are a predominant color. As a result, there are species whose names include such words as Cercelene, which is sky blue, Cenarius, which is ashy, and Citrine, a light olive for some examples. But but my favorite avian hue is Isabelline. Why? Because of its off-color origins, that's why. So prepare to ratch. Isabella and her husband, Albert IV, Archduke of Austria, were the sovereign of the Spanish Netherlands from 1598 to 1621. British folklore goes that in 1601, a Spanish army led by Albert laid siege to Austin on behalf of her half-brother, King Philip III of Spain. Isabella apparently was feeling very, very confident in her husband's ability to win, so confident she vowed not to change her underwear until the city was 
taken. Unfortunately for Isabella and her entourage, her husband was not a great military tactician and the siege lasted until 1604, so three years. And for those three years, Isabella supposedly wore the same grubby underwear until they developed a range of unsavory coloration. Now if you're currently retching, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting up. Isabella, as a color description was used before the siege in the year 1600, the inventory of Queen Elizabeth's the first wardrobe. So if the color Isabellian predates the siege of Austin, then the expression must come from an earlier Isabella. The French, German, Italian, and Spanish languages all have versions of the word with a similar folk etymology, except that in all cases, the reference is to the eight month siege of Granada by Isabella I of Castile and her husband Ferdinand II of Aragon. So if any royal Isabella did give their underoos the world's worst tie dye job, then well, it seems likely it was Isabella of Castile. So let's talk about Isabella of Castile for number six and her bathing ban, shall we? So, Philip II, Isabella's father, banned bathhouses in 1576. So apparently it's in the genetics to be downright filthy. This may sound crazy, but in Spain, the Christian doctrine saw bathing as a corrupt practice that could only lead to nakedness. Apparently, being a human in your most natural form was considered hedonism and something unreligious. God forbid if you splash some water on you too. So, this belief was to such a wild extent, Christians often walked from England or France to Jerusalem as a ritual without washing or changing their clothes. After the conquest of Granada by the Christians, the Muslims of Spain not only had to give up their religion to survive the Inquisition, but they also had to give up bathing. Isabella and Ferdinand ordered the Muslim baths to be destroyed and informed them that bathing was strictly forbidden. Isabella boasted that she herself, their leader, had only bathed twice in her life, and pretty much every historian takes her word for it. Makes sense that she would be so grimy they can name a questionable shade of brown after her underwear. Naturally, the Muslim people are absolutely horrified because cleanliness is literally mandatory in their religion as the prerequisite for every form and mode of worship. And by extension, it had become culturally significant. To separate them from their religion and then ban their last remaining tie to it, that's dirtier than Isabella's briefs. Even when Columbus mentioned the daily bathing habits of the indigenous peoples of Bahamas and the Caribbean, Isabella was horrified to the point of rage and commanded them too as her new subjects to stop this blasphemous bathing practice at once. Number five, cesspool. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, cause you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the Palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guys hadn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet, and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now, around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels, and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now, come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. 
gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick. Is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible. That's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Number 10, chloroform for asthma. Yeah, chloroform, like the see ya, that kind of stuff. In the past, chloroform was occasionally used as a treatment for asthma, believe it or not, albeit with limited understandings of its potential risks and side effects, of course, as are all of these. The rationale behind this practice stemmed from the belief that asthma was caused by excessive bronchial spasm or nervous irritability. Now, it was thought that chloroform form at the time with its sedative and calming properties, calming properties, could relax the bronchial muscles and alleviate the symptoms of asthma attacks. On paper, sure, sounds maybe doable. Scientifically, we're like, no, never, don't do that at all, please God. Chloroform, a volatile liquid with anesthetic properties, was administered through inhalation. Patients would inhale the vapor, which was believed to have a soothing effect on the respiratory system, sure, providing temporary relief from the constriction and wheezing associated with asthma. Chloroform is a potent and toxic substance, known to depress the central nervous system and cause respiratory depression when administered in excessive amounts. Oh, additionally, it carries the risk of addiction and long-term health complications. So no, not a great start on this list today. Number nine, flowers for cataracts. In traditional medicine, periwinkle flowers were sometimes used as a treatment for cataracts. Cataracts, a condition characterized by the clouding of lens in the eye, shout out to my brother Kyle, he's blind as sh Periwinkle flowers contain alkaloids such as vincamine and vincristine, which are known to have pharmacological effects on the circulatory system. I sound like Bill Nye. It was believed that these compounds could enhance blood circulation to the eyes, potentially improving vision and slowing down the progress of these cataracts. People would prepare infusions or extracts from the flowers and then apply them topically or consume them orally in the hopes, again, mostly hopes here, that their vision problems would go away or something would alleviate. However, it's important to note that the efficiency of periwinkle flowers in treating cataracts has not been scientifically proven at all. Eating flowers is not gonna help your eye. Of course not. You know what I mean? Cataracts are a complex condition with various underlying causes, and their treatment typically requires surgery or corrective lenses. Not a couple flower petals. That's not, what is this? No, definitely not. Number eight, sour cream hands. Nice, that was my nickname back in elementary. In the past, old sour cream was occasionally used as a home remedy to alleviate chapped hands. Nice, let's do it. Taco Tuesdays, let's do it. The rationale behind this practice was that the lactic acid present in sour cream could, maybe, potentially, not really, help exfoliate dead skin cells and moisturize the hands. Sounds gross, but it kinda worked sometimes. The creamy consistency of sour cream was believed to create a protective barrier, preventing further moisture loss and promoting healing. However, before you go in and ruin your taco night at home, it's important to note that this remedy lacks any scientific evidence and may not provide long-lasting or optimal results. Yeah, sour cream, just keep that on your, keep that on your wrap, not your hands. 
then you're all set. Number seven, Nux vomica. In history, Nux vomica derived from the seeds of Strychnos Nux vomica tree, very poisonous. It was occasionally used as a remedy for headaches. Not a good plan. This practice was based on the belief that the seeds contained compounds that could alleviate pain. Sure, again, good attempt, bad landing. Nux vomica was thought to have stimulant properties, increasing blood flow, relieving tension, all that good stuff, which in turn could provide relief from headaches. However, it's important to note that the seeds contains strychnine, which is a highly toxic substance, one of the worst of the worst for humans to eat, and their use as a remedy is not supported by the modern medical knowledge at all. Safer and more effective treatments for headaches are now available. You don't have to be eating any poisonous nuts. Thank you so much. Number six, urine. In ancient history, urine, P, number one, it was sometimes used as a medical treatment due to the belief that it possessed healing properties. Yeah, pour it in your eyes, see what happens. Don't do this. The practice can be attributed to various factors, including cultural beliefs, limited medical knowledge, of course, and the symbolic association of urine with bodily fluids and purification. Yeah, that last one's a big one. One reason urine was used as a treatment with this historical connection to the concept of uroscopy. That's where the color and smell and taste of urine was examined to diagnose illnesses. Yeah, some dude would be like, Bronchitis. That man's got bronchitis. Go get him. This practice originated from the belief that urine was a reflection of the body's overall health and imbalances. In some way, sure. In most ways, no. Furthermore, urine was considered to have cleansing properties and was believed to contain a substance that could combat infection and promote healing. Mmm, that good healing stuff. There we go. Brewing up that healing potion. It was used topically to clean wounds, it was used as eye drops to treat eye infections, and it was even consumed orally for various ailments. However, it is crucial to note that the use of urine as a medical treatment in ancient times, or any of those times, was not based on scientific understanding or evidence whatsoever. They were just putting pee in their eyes and just hoping for the best. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's meal times, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. 
you know? You have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I have no I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously today, horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices. But bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, Add some salt to this. And now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes. Maybe too high actually. As if you didn't win, it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its nine pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't wanna be on the losing side, as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure. But if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number eight, hot chocolate. As a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet, cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet. Partially from the snow, and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too. More so just chocolate, actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing, so it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough, and it was also, 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 used as a ritual drink, except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers and other unusual flavor enhancers. To, for chocolate, I don't, the pepper, I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate, it's, it's pepper and chocolate, it's a weird, hot, cho uh, spicy chocolate, not a, not a fan, not a fan. Number seven, corn goddess. I like corn just as much as the next guy. 
roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy, whoo, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders though. The little metal thingies that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later, that's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan Festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshipping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, nope, she's got a lust for blood so that means uh, off with the head. Number 6 End Times We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't, did it. Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old fashioned blanket solution. <laughs> Number five, hair removal. Since the dawn of hair, we've been looking for creative ways to get rid of it. Too much of a good thing, and we could all use less of it. Egyptians in particular did not much care for body hair, and the beauty standard was completely shaven clean. Now, while you or I might use a razor, or if you know, a little tougher than I am and braver, you might book a waxing. But back in Egypt, they didn't have these luxuries. They had something similar to wax. They used a cream made of hippo fat, tortoise shell, burnt lotus leaf. And if that doesn't sound particularly appetizing, what about the alternative cream that was sometimes used made of boiled bird bones, dung, lard, milk, gum, and salt? I'm not sure there's a single ingredient in either of those that smells pleasant, and I can't imagine putting that anywhere near your mouth, but hey, beauty. Now that sounded gross, but it's just that, it's gross. It's not actively harmful the same way that Stone Age women in the Mediterranean and across Asia would remove their body hair by using a cream made from arsenic, quicklime, and water. I think of those three, water is the only ingredient in that that is not actively toxic, and that's, ooh, that's because we're mostly made of water. Number four, animal dung baths. We're talking about Rome again for number four, and we'll be talking about Rome again at the bottom of this list. Let me spoil that for you. Nothing good. You know, you're on a list of old hygiene practices that make no sense, not a list of old hygiene practices that were lovely. The Romans needed to keep their skin looking nice and clean, and so for that, they would get facials out of a very natural and renewable source from crocodile feces. Are we surprised that the people who brush their teeth with pee were also using poop to wipe their face? I feel like a six year old. The Romans believed that this had beautiful properties and kept you looking young. To the Romans, a very pale face meant a life spent indoors and away from the hardship of manual labor, so it was a desirable look. So the way to achieve this baby face was by mixing crocodile poop and mud and then smearing that all over your face. Or if you were looking for a full body spa treatment, you get into a nice relaxing crocodile poop bath. Oh, I tell you, after a long day at the Colosseum fighting lions, nothing does a body better than just sinking into a little crocodile crap. Oh, just like home. Number three, ear spoons. All right, let's start talking about stuff that's really gonna make your stomach churn. I'm gonna struggle to get through these last couple of bits. Earwax, let's talk about it. We've all got it, but we don't want it. It's probably one of the worst things that comes out of your body. Top five, easy. Well, nowadays, we just use Q-tips to clean that up. Although, if you believe anti-Q-tip propaganda, you're not supposed to do that. Well, ancient people didn't have that piece of trivia or any sanitary methods of ear cleaning at all, really, and instead relied on disgusting objects like the ear spoon or ear picks. Ear picks were frequently made of bone or brass and were just another normal tool that you have on your person at all times. 
Archaeologists primarily found them around Scandinavian countries, a lot of Viking areas, where it was very common to keep a little, little ear spoon on your necklace so that you'd never have to be without it. You know, in case you're in the middle of a battle and you can't hear Hrothgar giving you orders because you got too much earwax plugging it all up, just take your little ear spoon, just start, you know, digging all that stuff out. I actually think ear spoons should make a comeback. That's controversial. That's my hot take for this video. Bring back ear spoons. Number two, tooth removal. All right, all right, let's 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 see if we can make me actively gag. Anything involving teeth are kind of my kryptonite, so let's just try to get through this. In the Jomon culture of the Japanese archipelago, around 13,000 years ago, people practiced the ritual of removing their teeth for ceremonial reasons. 90% of their population were thought to have extracted upper and lower canines and incisors. Now you might be sitting there wondering, why would they do that? <laughs> Did they have too many teeth? Did they just have a lot of cavities? Well, in their community, they believed that the body was a physical symbol of membership in your community. You know, like how the world changes, your body changes too. And there was this belief that the mouth was a great way to display change. All that to mean that extraction of different teeth tell your story. And through a smile, people could tell about different milestones in your life. A, a new baby, a marriage, a death of a loved one. Kind of like how people get tattoos to commemorate things, but infinitely more painful before the advent of Novocaine. I'd say this practice is still in play, because if I see someone and they smile and they're missing a bunch of teeth, it definitely does tell a story. It just is not a story I want to hear. And number one, the wiping stick. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with this. I can't help it. <sighs> the Romans, the Romans, the Romans, the Romans. They were one of the most innovative societies in human history, and in a lot of ways, some of the most absolutely barbaric. So say you were visiting ancient Rome, and you wanted to do as the Romans do, and you went to the bathroom, and you were wondering how you should wipe yourself. Well, you would use the ancient Roman practice of using a stick that had honey and vinegar on the end of it. Ha, ah, I probably wouldn't do that. Well, if you couldn't afford yourself a tersororium, that's the fancy name for the butt wiping stick, you could always use the alternative method, which was that all over Rome was loads and loads of discarded pottery, smashed, broken, terracotta, and clay. Most common vessels were full of pottery shards, or pesoi, an ancient Greek word for pebbles. So neither of those sound particularly appetizing, the honey stick, the clay pebbles. Romans would collect scrap pebbles that look particularly smooth in order to avoid, you can probably figure out why you would want a smoother stone to do that particular action. This was not like a secret shameful thing the Romans did. This was an important enough part of their life that they would depict this on pottery and in their art. Archaeologists have found vases and pots that show men squatting with clothing raised. Art imitates life, after all. Well, that was disgusting. I need to go find myself a bucket to throw up a little bit into. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the, someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853. After having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief, however, in 1872, an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay, 
Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure all, and it's number seven in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number six is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Number 5. Steam Baths now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean come on just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine. You walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. It's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works Part Two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. 
Puberty induced body odor. Not to worry, your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with a hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. While not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family, ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number nine, 40 year old's worst nightmare. Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that you ain't as limber as you used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was gonna say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something, but no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the peace deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number eight, ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. Their alchemy skill was maxed out. I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not gonna stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. 
Number seven, Tales from the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is gonna be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just sort of mash it up there and just well then they drain the contents from the nose, which that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt and the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers which is a cat and be mummified because well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kinda worked because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt and they're in amazing condition, considering the age, of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? Just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room, and he cuts what he has to cut. It's done, there it is. That's it, it's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to meat and veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't don't do that. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again. I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean, the things you had to craft back then, and then, you know, put, uh, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four, Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzensang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-Tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-Tips. That's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. They just called it Sweet Rays. Maybe they gave it like the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce, and I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-Tips were dipped in boric acid, and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, my eyes throw back every time. I get so, I go way too deep. I get too deeper, I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q soaps, Q oils, Q creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears, what's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore, just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero, gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. 
I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure, thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath and Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them, on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually, Tiafana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiafana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote-unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that. But back then, it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, toothworms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages 
because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one! Oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like and I've smelt my garage and garbage day and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nosegays were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. 
They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sort of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system, again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. Smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and matching chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Rappenstrauch in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one. Soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap. The answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans, because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten. And then invented again. And then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold, produced, and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs. A vital step towards large-scale soap production, and it actually started in 1791 when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850, and it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it. That's actually it. Yeah, we like that. That's it. Number 9, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. 
After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight, my heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible, and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious, as you know that DEF CON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom, or be late for your event, or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire, as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyeing their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Yeah, so number five is the highly debated blood baths. Oh, you saw Kim Kardashian event at the Vampire Facial? Girl, please. The culture vulture ain't got nothing on this. So, enter Elizabeth Bathory, who was either genuinely a menacing sociopathic killer or a pawn incriminated by family. If she was the first one, then you could definitely count her fave beauty hack as uncommon. So, Bathory is often proclaimed as the most prolific female killer of all time, accused of more than 600 plus young women's deaths inside her lavish castle. According According to legend, she believed bathing in virginal blood would grant her eternal youth. And according to witnesses, if you want to believe a bunch of biased people after her money, Bathory's crimes took place between 1590 and 1610, with the most vicious happening after her husband's death in 1604. And it would take the blood of three maidens to fill Bathory's clawfoot porcelain tub. She would also use the blood as lip tint and rouge, and Bathory's alleged crimes have inspired films, plays, operas, television shows, and even video games. And you may be wondering, what is that exotic scent. Well, it's number four, dead 
cat musk. Henry VIII had some fun and fabulous hygiene habits. He invented groom of the stool, didn't bathe often, and when he did, it was in an olden age version of a wooden jacuzzi tub. And he always had someone else wash his undercarriage. Sometimes while taking these baths to ease the pain in his sore leg, Henry soaked a mixture of herbs, musk, and civet. What is civet? Well, the segment's name should probably imply it. It's a dead cat. It's a fancy kind of dead cat to be particular because it's small, wild, and carnivorous with a super distinct smell. I am not sure what cat musk smells like, but if it's anything like the smell of their spray, I am more than okay with not knowing. Like many people of his day, Henry also went to bed in a piece of fur so that fleas and lice would jump on it and not his royal skin. Which begs the question, wouldn't the fleas be confused if you smelled like a dead cat? Banned from drinking it, but loved to bathe in it. Number three is Mary Queen of Wine. Get it? Because she's usually called Mary Queen of Scots, and Scots sounds like scotch. Went too far with it. That's okay. Anyway, so apparently Mary Queen of Scots wouldn't bathe in mere water, but in sweet white wine, as she believed it to be good for her complexion. She wouldn't touch a drop of the drink, being staunchly religious, but she still kept wine stores just to have poured in her bathtub, believing it to make her look pale and beautiful. Also, Mary equipped this as a form of pain relief. With venotherapy, including wine massages, facials, and baths for remaining popular today, this shouldn't actually come as a surprise, especially because wine baths can be traced back to the times of Greece and Rome. There's even a very famous 16th century recipe called Afar Bella Fascia, which translates to, to make a beautiful face. And it has a recipe to create a cosmic brew by boiling rosemary flowers with white wine. Quite a few people have tried it, as you can find the recipe online, and one tester group was called the Beautiful Chemistry Project, which studies its effects on skin quality and discovered that the process released essential oils and chemicals with antibacterial, moisture binding, collagen growth stimulating, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, brightening and soothing effects. Number two is the stuff of nightmare. It's the permed wig. This really came as a shocker and is quite weird. So when King Charles II had intercourse with ladies, he would collect some of their down their hair and then he would stitch it into a wig, which he donated to a club for rich nobles. I don't know, to like look at it. And then it was stolen from that club where someone starts another club where people came just to kiss the, the wig thing. Anyway, so King George IV was so inspired by this, he started doing the same. But unfortunately, he failed to complete his down there hair wig because he died before he finished collecting enough hair. Yeah, moving on. And last but not least, number one, ohaguro. So the Japanese custom of blackening one's teeth is an ancient practice, whether in the famous Genji Monogatari, a book from the 12th century that is considered the world's very first novel, or in various fairy and folk tales. The art of blackening one's teeth held a prominent place in Japan's history for some time. One of the main reasons for ohaguro is the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded with immense beauty. It's only natural that people want to get closer to to what they deem as beautiful, just like the process of having one's teeth bleach to appear more white in modern times. So using a solution called Kenimizu, made out of ferric acetate from iron fillings mixed with vinegar and tannin from vegetables or tea, the custom was first used to celebrate someone's coming of age. Around the end of the Heian period, teeth blackening was done by adult aristocrats and nobles regardless of gender on a daily basis. By the time we hit the Edo period in 1603, teeth blackening is a sign of nobility and aristocracy is exclusively, especially amongst wealthy married women trying to mimic the allure of a geisha. Even now when walking the streets of Kyoto, Japan's old capital, it's not uncommon to meet a mako with pitch black teeth. As you might know, during the end of the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period, Japan was visited by western foreigners after almost 200 years of seclusion. Being used to western beauty standards, many visitors were shocked to see women with black teeth walking around. Some even thought that the Japanese people had terrible mouth hygiene, mistaking the dye for actual tooth rot, and then others, having realized the blackening was on purpose, wondered why Japanese women would disfigure themselves. Okay. So Ohagoro was banned by the Meiji government in 1870 to appeal to Western opinions, and the art of dyeing one's teeth was almost forgotten. Today it can be seen in theaters, movies, and the aforementioned Kyoto, where Geisha and Maiko still roam the street. Kicking off the list at number 10, Koremlu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karemlu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. 
This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body, what, your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's oriental cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, moles migraines. The use of dead moles as a remedy for migraines was based on certain folk belief and traditions. Now, it was believed that the properties of a dead mole could help alleviate the pain with your migraine. Somehow, in some way, shape, or form. We're just gonna grind up a mole and see what happens. One method involved doing such. One method, you had to dry the mole and then grind it into a fine powder. This powder was then either consumed orally or mixed with water. It's like the worst crystal light ever. You'd be shaking that for hours before it looks good. Or this powder was applied topically to your 
your temple or your forehead. Just dead mole rat powder. It smells great. It was thought that the potent energy or the mystical qualities possessed by the mole would be transferred to this individual, providing relief from migraines. However, do I have to say it anymore? No, it didn't work. The use of dead moles as treatment for migraines lacks scientific evidence and it's not supported at all today. Because yeah, imagine rolling up to the doctors and he starts grinding up a mole rat. He's like, what is it today? Your foot? Is your foot hurting? No problem, we'll get you all sorted out. Number four, medieval dung. We talked about number one, now we gotta talk about number two. That's the order it comes in. In medieval times, dung, animal feces, was occasionally used as an ingredient for these treatments. I know, where is he gonna put it this time? This practice may seem a little odd to us today, but hear me out, it had some legs back then. Had some prevailing medical theories and limited understanding, but it was something. Dung, poop, animal poop, was believed to possess these medical properties such as its supposed ability to draw out toxins, stimulate healing, or serve as a topical antiseptic. It was used in various forms, most commonly in ointment, and was applied to wounds, ulcers, skin conditions, you name it, man, get creative, whatever hurts, put some poop on it. Yeah, welcome to these times. Animal dung, such as, you know, the dung from cows or pigeons, it was commonly used due to its availability. Yeah, you thought urine was bad, but it gets worse. Pigeon poop for your elbow? I'm like, I don't know, man. This doesn't seem very good. Number three, mercury. Mercury, yeah, the element. Let's do this. In ancient times, mercury was used as a medicine due to its perceived healing properties. Now, this was an element, okay? It's not poo, it's not pee, it's something. It's something legit in the scientific community. It was believed to have a range of therapeutic effects, including treating infections, skin conditions, and even mental disorders. All that in a drop of mercury. How lucky are you? Mercury was applied topically or ingested orally, so terrible, with the idea that it could purify the body and balance your humors and promote overall well-being <laughs> with the element mercury, of course. However, the use of mercury in ancient medicine was based on horrible, incomplete knowledge and its toxicity was not fully understood at the time. Yeah, don't eat that. Don't put that anywhere near you. Prolonged exposure to mercury often results in severe health complications, including neurological damage. So if you have a headache, don't go back in time. That's pretty much it. Trepanation. Ancient trepanation, also known as trephination. You want to be all fancy, throw that the fancy pH in there. It was a surgical procedure in which a hole was drilled or scalped into the skull. Now this practice dates back thousands and thousands of years and it was performed in various ancient cultures for some reason. It was believed to serve different purposes, including relieving headaches, treating skull fractures, well, creating one, or my personal favorite, releasing evil spirits. Evil spirits, yes, finally, be gone. Trepanation was performed using crude tools and horrible techniques, often without anesthesia. So you'd be awake to feel most of it, at least. The motivations behind trepanation in ancient times remained a subject of debate, encompassing medical, religious, and cultural factors. And also, Saw 3. I think it's a little bit of Saw 3 in that one, for sure. That's terrifying. And finally, number one, it's all in your head. In the ancient Babylonian world, illnesses were commonly connected to, you guessed it, supernatural forces. Yep, next time you get a sore throat, it's the devil, nothing else. Malevolent spirits or divine retribution, all because you're sick. As a result, the role of Babylonian healers resembled that of priests and exorcists more than modern physicians, which is so silly. The treatments incorporated elements of magic and ritualistic practices. For instance, if a patient exhibited teeth grinding, this healer would interpret that as a sign of a deceased family member attempting to communicate to them during sleep. So in turn, they're Mm, they're drawing, you know, they're trying to talk back, I guess. Drawing from ancient necromantic texts, the healer would prescribe a peculiar remedy. The patient was then advised to sleep next to a human skull for an entire week. To ensure the effectiveness of this unsettling treatment, the tooth grinder, this mm, Mr. Talky Talk, he was instructed to kiss and lick the skull seven times every night. Which, I mean, first of all, terrible for your sleep. You're not gonna get a wink with that schedule. But also disgusting. Whose head is this? I have so many questions. Why? This is a fetish. This isn't a a, a practice? These rituals demonstrate the intricate blend of spiritual beliefs and medical practices that characterize Babylonian healthcare. Growing up, I had a humidifier, so almost the same thing, kind of the same as a human skull. And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the 2nd century BC, 
the first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean, well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks, think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No, no you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty jobs, but nothing as shitty as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel although how painful and stinky it was, I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least, those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes, looking for a job description. Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it. Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgust. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no, more like mint and vinegar. And prayer, just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and Call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six, 
toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health. And that means after a long day, you need entertainment. That's why you came here, hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs had been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoying music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number four, more than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs, and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well, I don't have a joke for that, they just kinda got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many, dude, that's that's wrong. Which, if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could've helped you fight out the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. What do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice, because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old fashioned peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. George, take your skin off. I don't know why Jerry Seinfeld's skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Because that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. Chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh it was difficult, especially because we have no self-control and we went a little crazy with it. Take for example that having multiple wives was a status symbol, and let me tell you something, they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, they were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smelling weirdos. Number one, wiped out, dude. Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, <laughs> we got the Aztec sick again, Dutch. <laughs> I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs>